Hey, everybody, this is Dan with Pain Free You. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of introducing David from London. And um, he sent me an email and pretty much said, I got a story to tell. I've got a success with this mind body work, and I'd love to share it with your audience. So here we are. Uh, David, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thanks for offering to share your story. I'm sure it will inspire many people. Thank so, you for having um, me. Yeah, why don't you take a few minutes and just kind of maybe introduce yourself and start us off on the journey. What, Where you been, what's going on, and you know how you're doing these days. Yeah, um, like you mentioned, my name is David and I'm from London. Um, I would say that my symptoms first appeared in 2015. So okay. that's been about eight years I've been going through this. And um, you know, till this day, I still don't know the source but um, as I've been growing, growing through this like journey, you know, it seems to me that sometimes in life you won't always find the answers, but that's okay. Right. And uh, I don't know, part of um, going through this journey of chronic pain, I think it's important to learn to accept some of these things that we go through. So for me, I was in education at the time I was in college and and all of a sudden I started to feel all sorts of sensations throughout my body from head to toe. Um, it was, it started off like electricity, like a pricking feeling. I don't want to, um, you know, say anything that would trigger anybody. So I won't be like too graphic or anything, but yeah, it would envelop, um, my whole body, you know, and, um, my symptoms were, varied but these pricking feelings quickly turned into severe pain spasms and then and also involuntary body movements i don't know if that makes sense but essentially just like you know spasms throughout the body okay <clears throat> and um i don't know with these type of illnesses or conditions you know it, it's difficult to know where to go or who to talk to you know it's like how do i tell someone that I just have pains randomly in my body or that my body is seemingly moving on its own. You know, it's yeah. in my head, it seemed ludicrous, you know? Right. Um, yeah. So I, I actually, I lived like that for many years. Um, and the pain symptoms would be on and off at that time. And, you know, throughout the day, it never got in the way of my daily life or my schooling. Like, it wasn't debilitating at that point, but that was until 2019 when I actually finished where I graduated right? and uh, my symptoms seemed to just kick up to a whole another gear. Um, uh, interestingly enough, I think I should say that just before then, I was actually doing well in several areas of my life. Like, I don't know, I was in my final year of education and I set myself a lot of goals in different areas of my life. So like my educational goals, my career, and even my physical health. Mm -hmm. And I achieved these goals. And okay. I guess I, I, I thought to myself and I decided like, oh, if I was able to have this systematic way of like achieving these goals in these mm -hmm. other areas of my life, I thought about these symptoms that I was kind of dealing with. And I was like, okay, maybe I can do the same. You know, why not with what I was going through? Um, and I don't know if it was because now I was putting so much focus on these symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. That the symptoms started to worsen. Um, pains that were occurring every so often were now permanent and um, yeah, chronic. Yeah, while it was just like maybe a few times in a day, it was it was twenty four seven. You know, as as long as I was awake or conscious, I was in pain. Like I would go to sleep in pain and I'll wake up in pain as long as I was conscious. Sure. Um, I started to feel it more viscerally in the body and um, the pain and the involuntary movement symptoms were a lot more aggressive and spasmodic. Mm -hmm. And um, the only way I could really explain it is like, um, in, in addition to like, obviously the, the pains being quite sharp, you know, when you like maybe come back from the gym and you've done a work on the few days after your muscles are a bit sore and so like it's <clears throat> if that restrictive feeling i felt a bit restricted mm -hmm. because of the pain 
So you can imagine my um, emotional state during this time. All of a sudden, everything just got so much worse. I was, um, I'm still a person who I'm quite young, so I was rather youthful, and so to go from that to yeah, not so youthful. <laughs> I'm trying to recover my words. Um, I, I was, I don't know. I went to hospital continuously, and they'd find nothing, of course. Right. Um, but being in a situation like that without accurate knowledge and your body seemingly working against you um yeah i was living in a i was living in anxiety and frustration really honestly um so over the years those symptoms actually became a lot worse and were deteriorating i stopped being able to walk far um I don't know if it's the same in a, if you have in America, if they call it by the same name, but like we have a corner shop, which is just like yeah. when you're in a residential area, yeah, just around the corner, about three, four minutes. Um, so like a mini supermarket, I can go to any grocery, get quick groceries. <clears throat> just that simple walk was like, I would come back in so much pain. And so it was horrible to the point where I soon became confined to my room. Mm-hmm. I would even have, um, it was either I was bedridden in my bed or I'd have this special chair, I guess, you know, because with the symptoms, I just didn't feel comfortable in any other chair. So I just sit there most days with spasms also that I was having around in the throat area. It kind of made it hard to eat. And so soon I was struggling with solid foods and I was just literally on liquids as well, like soups and custards. And so, well. Wow. I lost a lot of weight rapidly at that time, actually. And uh, my BMI was definitely very low. I actually took a picture, which I do have during that time. And I was very, very thin, like a twig, like I was very skinny. Um, With this same like spasms in the throat, I was struggling to talk. And so people came to visit me. Most of the time I would communicate literally by writing down on a piece of paper or through text. You know, and um, I don't want to like just <laughs> uh, talk about like all of these bad things that happened to me. But I guess the point that I'm making is like you can imagine with all of these different things that were occurring. It's it's like accumulating and compounding into like a bad situation where mm. what's the word? I was almost uh, confirming certain ideas that I had in my mind. And it was like a vicious cycle, you know, it's like this belief that um, I wasn't well and that there's a a lot of problems going on and like more so, let's say, if I was to do certain activity, something bad would happen and that would almost restrict me in itself and it would make the symptoms worse. It's heightening the fear and the anxiety, the vicious cycle. It's just compounding, getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah. Um, and I would say, because I actually did find out about Dr. Sana and even through your videos, I learned more about him. And um, one of the most important, I don't know if it's his laws he has, but... Um, 12 daily reminder. Out, uh, reminder, okay, yeah. So I'd have to paraphrase, but something along the lines of um, you must return to daily activity or normal yeah. activity. Re- yeah, resume physical activity. <clears throat> Stop right. the treatments, resume physical activity, talk to your brain, think psychologically, not physically. And those are the ones I can remember off the top of my head, but there was like 12 of them. Yeah, I think that that one was that the most important for me. And I think was the most important thing to learn resume. is that little by little resuming the activity as well. Mm-hmm. There were times where I actually struggled with it at first because... Um, it was almost like a step forward, two steps back. Maybe I tried too hard and then the fear will heighten and I would do less, et cetera. Um, That's a very things. common experience, by the way. A lot of people struggle with resuming activity because if I can just touch on the core basic of what's going on, um, um, for some reason you weren't able to connect the dots, but for some reason your brain perceived some danger, started some symptoms. Yeah. And we start to get concerned with symptoms. We start to go to doctors. They don't have answers for us. Oh, you know, 
David, you're fine. You're healthy. We don't see anything. And you're going, I don't feel healthy. What's all this? And we, we become more fearful of our own experience mm-hmm. with all of these symptoms. And the more doubt you have, the more fear you have, the more focus and attention on it that you that you place on it. You know, and I I would just surmise that while you were still in school, you were focused on school, which meant that it didn't really go crazy. But now once you finished school, you had yeah. more time on your hands and there was more time focused on what's going on with me. And mm. you know, fear compounds, it grows, it magnifies. And the more doubt you have as to what's going on, the more fear is created, the more fear equals more perceived danger, which means more symptoms. And um, the great news is that you found out about Sarno, you started opening your mind to the potential that maybe this isn't some mystery disease, which you right. know, I'm sure a lot of your thoughts were going down that path. Like the doctors just haven't found it yet. I'm really yeah, sick. There's something wrong. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I didn't mean to jump in there, but it, when you look at everything that you went through <laughs> under the umbrella of your brain, turning on signals, sensations, symptoms, muscle spasms, pains, as a result of perceiving danger, you mm-hmm. can you can correlate that as the fear grew, so did the symptoms. So I just wanted to point that out for anybody who's watching. Um, so I'll let you get back to your story. Um, I, I, I completely agree. I also think, so that in that same way, the reverse is true. And the way to reduce the symptoms is to come almost like dial down that fear yes. of perceived danger. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and I can go into, there was a few ways in which um, I almost, I guess, taught my brain to not see danger in these daily activities. But um, one thing on my own journey, as I started to go through it, I don't know, some, when you have like chronic pain, it's interesting, like you can get to a point where you kind of get a bit more emotionally tough, we could say, where you um, you start to get almost desensitized to certain conditions. The funny thing about the brain is like, it's almost like as soon as it sees that you're not as worried about this symptom, it changes the symptom into like a different form so that you have something else to be fearful of. And one thing that I noticed that I started doing was I would try to distract myself from what I was going through with anything that I could, like constantly, maybe I'd put music on or I'd watch all maybe videos or TV just to try and distract myself. And I noticed as I was doing that, <clears throat> I know that you talk on your channel about like, indifference to pain, I believe, right? So I don't know, in my opinion, I feel like it's how can you be indifferent if you haven't first maybe accepted some of these symptoms that you're going through. So one thing that I started to do is I, I acknowledged that I am distracting myself in a way and I allowed myself the time just to sit and not run from the pain, but all the emotions, but just to allow whatever I'm feeling to happen. And sometimes I'll just sit there and um, not trying to like fight the pain, but I'll just sit and I'll let, it happened, you know, I'm not scared of it or running from it anymore. It's, um, a big at deal. first, it, at first it w- would be obviously, it's very, you know, it's you're vigilant, like you're saying, like it's painful and everything. But after a while I didn't notice, like, even if I was just there for 10 minutes, some sort of meditation, I, like, just, it is dialed down. Like I'm feeling a lot calmer. It doesn't have to go away completely, but I am feeling calmer Imagine. and I know it. Yeah, mentally and emotionally, because you changed your response to the symptoms, <coughs> the brain perceived David's safe because right. it's freaking out and fighting it and trying to figure it out. And the brain's going, we're in trouble. So by just sitting and allowing, accepting that this is where I am right now, your it's brain, he's doing pretty good. And things yeah. can down. Safety, danger. Danger, symptoms go up. Safety, they can come down. And you're proving that. Or you've proved it with your own experience. So that's great. That's true. Once the emotional state has gone down, as well, because I'm getting calmer through the meditation, I actually know that um, a lot of people who have chronic pains, I do understand that a lot of them 
sometimes when people propose to them to do almost like a meditation, they do, they come back with their, they like, I was like, oh, how dare you? you don't understand how painful it is. Like how, like you try meditating with all of these pains happening. And I honestly, I completely understand that. And but I feel like at first you will feel a certain way, but with time you do notice that, like I said, even if it maybe doesn't fully go away, you do feel calmer and it's, you're not in that space of anxiety as well. I feel like that's almost like a second pain that's that your whole brain is consumed with everything that's going on. <clears throat> so yeah, I felt calm in that way. I would say the second thing actually is that, um, so like I said, I was going in and out of hospital all the time, they weren't finding anything, but there was a time where they were able to diagnose FND, which is functional neurological disorder. But that's essentially the same thing that we're all talking about here. It's, it's the idea that the pain is not structural, but for some reason, the mind is perceiving danger and creating that pain. Yeah. Functional neurologic um, disorder is basically saying that the nervous system is sending pain when it shouldn't. That's right. not how it's supposed to work. <clears throat> they give it this fancy medical label called functional neurological disorder, and people go, oh, no, I've got that? That sounds bad. <laughs> Right. And, and, you know, what you're seeing and what you're sharing with the audience here is that it's all the same thing. It is. The brain's perfectly working <laughs> perfectly. It's just got bad information. So it's perceiving danger where it doesn't really exist. And it's acting as if the danger is real. So it's sounding the, the alarm system. And so for anybody who's gotten those type of medical labels from doctors, Functional neurologic disorder is basically describing what's happening, but it's not really a thing that's wrong with your body. It's just that, right. you know, it's like a bad computer program. It's it's not going to do what it's supposed to because it's operating on bad code or bad data and you get the wrong output. So uh, for anybody with that FND diagnosis or any other type of diagnosis, usually the brain's working fine. It's just bad information, bad data, add fear to that. And, uh, you know, you've got a system that's doing all sorts of weird stuff like you described. So, especially when it's chronic pain, I think when it's chronic pain, the, the brain is almost, it's almost living in the past and it's still remembering, I did this and this and this happened. And so it's almost repeating that pain. Like you said, as a warning signal to stop you and prevent you, but in doing so your world is kind of just shrinking. Oh yeah. And um, <clears throat> I think, so to move forward at the start of this year in January, I actually did go for like, they say like, it's like a rehabilitation program to rehabilitate into society and so like start doing things. Mm -hmm. But essentially it's everything that I did was what I learned from Dr. Sana and it was also getting that accurate knowledge. It was understanding that um, the way that I'm maybe predicting that certain events will happen and um, put myself on this high alert, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> yeah. Interestingly enough, the last quarter of last year before the program, almost in anticipation, I decided to start like actively working on some of Dr. Sarno's tips, for example, resuming daily activity. I tried to do the walks again. And um, like I said, at first I was walking, trying to go to the corner shop and I'll come back and I'll be in pain. But I kept going and um, not forcing it, but I did kept going and do the walks daily. And lo and behold, the, the symptoms go down. I start to notice at some point I'm not in as much pain and I'm almost relearning to walk again, etc. cetera. And um, I don't know if maybe it's me and I'm just an objective goal-driven person, but I guess knowing that there was this program that I was going to in January, there's less of that fear of like, just it's not something I'm like, oh, I have to keep on doing this walk every day and be in pain. But I'm like, okay, no, let me do this for this few months and I'm priming myself and I'll get better and better. And I was able to walk further, I'll push the goalpost and I'll walk a longer distance and I'll come back and I'm doing more of the things that I'm doing. And so when I went into the rehabilitation program, it's essentially exactly that. We would look at all of the things that I would do in my daily life that I was almost stopping myself from, that I was shrinking my life. But this time now we're trying to expand and we're trying to do these things little by little. So maybe I was struggling to talk before. 
Mm-hmm. So I started to, you know, have just normal conversations, et cetera, and safe environments for me. But I'll go walking in different areas, et cetera. And one of the big things I think I learned was this idea of behavioral experiments. I don't know if you're aware of that. What was it? Behavioral experiments. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, essentially it, it has its own work. She was like, you, um, maybe there's something that you're afraid of doing. And so you, you look into that and like, what do I predict will happen if I'm to do this task? And you write how sure you are after it. Then you think of an experiment of how can we maybe prove this wrong or right? What can I do? So for example, me walking or someone maybe may say like, oh, I don't want to bend down. I'm scared because if I bend down my back, pain will surely come up on my knees or anything, et cetera. So you, so you actually go and you do it. And then after you've done that experiment, you look and you analyze and you see the things that I've predicted, has it gone exactly like that? And you, you write again, for example, say if you said at the beginning, I'm a hundred percent sure this will happen. Maybe at the end you write, well, it never happened exactly like that. Um, maybe it's even just that I'm still here. I'm alive. I'm not catastrophizing. I'm, I'm yeah. still going like nothing actually happened. And in doing this, it's also teaching the brain that like, oh, you're safe. I'm fine after doing this activity. And I think the point is you're starting off with maybe you're writing it down, but the idea is you start doing this in your brain. Like when you're afraid of doing a task, you start looking at me like, oh, am I predicting that this will happen? And you go forward, you do it and you sit back and you analyze, did it happen exactly the way that I thought it would? No. And so little by little, you're coaching your mind into seeing that you are indeed safe. And I think this is, these are the things that I did that I believe lowered my symptoms and allowed me to just get better and better. And I'm engaging more in life and I'm expanding my life. And I think that's the main idea. It's not to be like an athlete or anything who would run a marathon, it's just to get back into daily life again. Yeah. So what i'm seeing there is that uh, you're confirming many of the things i talk about um where we're fearful of an experience so we avoid doing the thing that may trigger that experience so and that is how as you said your world got smaller and smaller because you were saying well i did this last time and that was the outcome i had more pain more symptoms more discomfort more fear. And so we do less and less and less, but it doesn't necessarily stop the symptoms. Mm. Essentially, when you avoid things, all you're doing is confirming the brain's belief that walking to the corner store is dangerous by avoiding. Whereas making a commitment, a decision and a commitment uh, to go there, and even if symptoms show up, you can be like, well, but I know what's happening. I'm not concerned with it and continuing to go. Eventually the the brain goes, David, look at that. You must be okay. You're getting to the store and back. And over time, see, it's one thing. A lot of people think, well, I'm in bed rest. I'm just going to tell my brain over and over and over that I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. Brain doesn't buy it. Still in bed rest. You're not going anywhere. You're not doing anything because every time you think about doing something, you say, no, I can't do that. That might make me hurt. It may cause my symptoms to go up. So I think it's show and tell. Yes. In, internal dialogue, internal conversations, reassuring yourself that I'm actually okay. Sarno's right. My body's fine. This is just, you know, mind body thing. That's great. All of that telling is really important to get the intellectual stuff down. But what you started doing was showing your brain that you're okay. And you know, I've talked in the past about in order to eliminate the symptoms, you need to be willing to experience them by doing mm-hmm. those quote unquote triggering activities like walking or, you know, at this point, I'm sure you're exercising and doing other things that, you know. Um, I, uh, <laughs> very you, recently, yeah. a few weeks needed, ago, I started going to the gym. Yeah, you needed to be willing to experience symptoms and understand that. When you do something new that you haven't done in a while, your brain may sound the alarm and go, hey, hey, David, what are you doing? Stop that. Yeah. Some symptoms. And that's when you turn to the brain and go, I'm actually okay. 
nothing bad happened. So you're showing the brain, you're leading the brain, you're consciously making a decision to say, I am going to do this. Mm. You're leading because when you get to the point of bed rest or, you know, chair bound, like you couldn't do anything, the symptoms were running the show. The symptoms were dictating everything. And the symptoms were creating the fear, which was keeping you at home. And so what you've had to do is through accurate knowledge, understanding exactly what's going on, mm. you started to make different decisions and different commitments to yourself that says, I'm going to do this every day. I'm going to get to the store and back. I'm going to do this. I'll walk farther. And what you did was your actions led your scared brain out of the dark alleyway and showed the brain we're actually okay and it, yeah. and it builds momentum because the more you do this and the more you realize what you're capable of doing where's your fear keeps coming down right so i didn't mean to cut off but i just really wanted to give you know some of the audience a little more understanding as to what your experience uh pretty much proves that this is how it works. The more you do, the more you're able to do, as opposed to, yeah. I have to sit in my room and avoid everything to get better. Well, if you just stay in your room, even if you can get to the point where you don't have many symptoms, you still got to go back out and live your life. And then at that point, the brain's <laughs> going to sound the alarms. So you may as well start out by recognizing what's going on and starting to take those proactive steps to teach, to show your brain. So a little bit of a ramble there, but uh, just wanted to clarify for anybody watching. But that's great. Your experience is absolutely proof. Um, this is how it works. So anything else you want to share? Yeah, I mean, lastly, I could say that I completely agree with what you say. Like, um, I was speaking to ourselves and reassuring ourselves is definitely good. But what I can learn from this situation is that the brain works off evidence, you know? Even when it's dialing up the pain, it's dialing up the pain because it has evidence, so to speak, of, oh, I did this and this was the result. And so <clears throat> once you keep like, getting out of your comfort zone and doing these things, you're almost building up a catalog of evidence or proof that says to you, mm -hmm. you are fine. Like you're, you, it's showing your brain, like you said, that you are indeed fine. And so the symptoms go down, obviously, and you're able to do more. <clears throat> Yeah, but the I mean, evidence is important because you can say, hey, brain, I'm perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with me. Right. And the brain's going to prove it. And when you start to go out and do more, even if symptoms turn on, if the false alarms are sounding and you still remain calm and you're saying, well, it's OK, we're going to keep doing this every day. You're now providing the brain evidence to back up your belief and your thoughts that say, I'm actually OK, Sarno's right. So the evidence is a great term. I like that word. Yeah. And I guess what, all, when I'm looking at it, all we're trying to do is really, what you say, dial down the fear, but like really lower that like emotional state that we're in, you know, get into that place of calm. And um, besides, I guess, doing these experiments and gaining evidence, I, another thing that I actually interestingly found helpful that I really believe in it was also like visualization as well almost using that as another technique to almost not be so reactionary to doing a task like just um imagine it like there'll be times where i'll actually just i would see myself um doing certain things there's a park nearby where i live it's a big park of a forest and before my symptoms i used to actually go for walks every day it's something that I was I love to do, and I do now, <laughs> but um, obviously that's something that became narrow in my life and I wasn't able to do that, but I would literally just, I would see myself walking through this park and it was so viscerally, I like the, the smell and the feelings, the wind, etc. And it's only until not long ago that, you know, I was walking through the park again and it was just as I imagined and I remember just thinking like, um, oh, this is something that I was dreaming about, but the reason why I think the visualization side is important it's almost because it's going through that process again and again because sometimes we can even be afraid to imagine certain things that we're scared of and it yeah. produces fear i think that's an interesting thing but you know it's just going through that thing and uh almost letting your brain realize that it's okay it's confronting it's not running away from the fear but 
going for it. It's a perfectly safe thing to do because what we're talking about is really safe activities, honestly. Especially imagining something, but that's also <coughs> evidence. Because if you can imagine taking a walk through the woods and your symptoms are going, hey, hey, what are you doing? Mm. Better proof that your brain's involved and your brain is controlling this because you didn't even take the walk through the woods. That's true. Sometimes the anxiety will go up, the symptoms will go up, and there's lots of examples. Um, so visualization is key. I have a lot of people go, I'm not good at visualizing. Yes, you are. You're just visualizing a bad outcome. You're predicting mm -hmm. a bad outcome. Just change the storyline so you predict a good outcome. Being joyful, out in nature, wind on your face. You're hearing the leaves blowing in the in the wind, right? Yeah. That, that's visualization of an outcome you want. Whereas yeah. people say, I don't know how to visualize. It doesn't work for me. It's working perfectly. We all visualize. Anytime you think of five minutes from now, five days from now, five years from now, you're visualizing. What movie are you watching in your head? The good one or the, the scary one, right? Right. Cool stuff. So you, you said, um, I don't know if you know that, Lance, like uh, someone said that the brain can't tell the difference between a real experience and an imagined experience. Like your nervous system reacts in the same way. I've heard that quote. I can't say who said it, but yes, I've heard that a number of times. Yeah. And I remember um, I had someone, I think I read in a book, but it's like they put this hypothetical of like if you imagine somebody's in the woods and they see a bear, right? The nervous system will react straight away. You know, it will do what it does and maybe it will run. <clears throat> Then well, what if you told that person that, um, well, imagine if somebody saw that same bear, but it happened just to be a person wearing a bear costume, the nervous system will still react the same way. And so um, I guess that just kind of proves the same point again. It's like what your brain believes is how the response that it will produce. So you have to teach your brain that information. Which is why the perception of danger is way more important than anything else when it relates to the creation of symptoms. Because if the brain perceives danger, it reacts as if that danger is actual. And it's our yeah. job through education, accurate knowledge, to retrain the brain and go, time out. We're not really broken. I've been to 42 doctors and they can't find anything wrong with me. So clearly I'm not sick. <laughs> I've got nothing wrong with me. I'm young. You know, I'm reasonably fit. And... Okay, so accurate knowledge will allow the perception of danger to come down. Now you still have to overcome the fear of the movement, the fear of getting out of the house, the fear of getting back to the floor because those things have hurt in the past. But being willing to experience the symptoms in trade-off of teaching the brain something new is what you were able to very successfully do. And that's why you're doing as well as you are because you intellectually understood it, but then you put it into action. You internalized it and said, I've got to do these things. And it seems like you were very thoughtful with these experiments and analyzing your predictions, which in the language I use is, what are my expectations? Do I expect mm. to have a horrible problem and be in bed for six days? Or do I expect that, okay, I may have some symptoms, but I didn't damage anything because I know what's going on. So yeah. predictions, expectations, the visualization for anybody who says, I don't know how to do that. You're doing it perfectly. You're just visualizing bad stuff. So um, that's brilliant how you kind of put all these things together and we're really able to navigate your way out of the forest. Um, baby steps, learning, adjusting. Let me do this. Let me, you know, let me implement things. So anything else you want to share? Um, that was mainly it, but yeah, it's obviously it, it spent a lot of years. Um, so it did take a long time to get there, but those are the main takeaways that can, like gave off. These are the, what, this is what works for me. And I feel like it's very much so in line with the things that you're teaching and Dr. Sana and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Very cool. So how are you doing today? Um, I would say I'm doing well, <laughs> honestly. Um, I'm, I'm getting better and better, you know, and I'm just moving more and more, etc. 
like I mentioned, I recently, this month, I went back to the gym after years of not doing that for a long time. Obviously, I'm meeting more, well, I'm converse, conversing more. And like I said, I'm engaging more in life. Um, my life is expanding and I'm able to do the things which I wasn't able to do before. So I'm, I'm happier for that reason. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. You know, the, the happiness component. I bet when you were deep into it, chair bound, bed bound, mm. didn't smile much at all. No. This wasn't accessible to you. Right. And yeah. some people are like, well, I'm obviously miserable. I haven't smiled in three years. Right. But the brain's primary responsibility is survival. And while you're in that crisis of not knowing what's going on or how to get out of it, right. you're like, oh, why aren't I happy? Your brain's going happy. That's not important. We're trying to survive here. We got a we got a problem. So mm. the fact that the joy and the happiness and gratitude for being able to do things is is back is absolutely rock solid evidence that your brain is feeling safer. Because now happiness, which is not at the top of the priority, is coming back into the mix and your brain's feeling safe enough to hey, we can appreciate and we can right. smile and we can laugh and we can um, be grateful. And so that's, that's excellent. And that's really, that's, that's what I see a lot of people happening. They're like, you know, in the beginning of the recovery, they're like, yeah, symptoms are still here, but I don't care as much. And I'm smiling mm. more, and I'm engaging more with other people. And yeah, so, this is brilliant, man. I uh, really appreciate you sharing this stuff because you not only, you know, obviously walked through your journey from 2015 to now, um, but you really pointed out very well the things that really helped you, that that moved you forward considerably. And uh, the fact that it aligns with many of the things I teach is great because it's evidence. It's like, all right, you know, for anybody who's like, I don't know, Dan says the same stuff all the time. Well, here's proof. David's yeah. proof that when you implement this stuff and you actually start to go outside of your comfort zone, leave the house, the brain has no choice but to go, I guess he's okay because he's going out, he not panicking. So brilliant. I love what you shared. Anything else before we wrap it up? No, that's it for me. But thank you for having me and thank you for this platform as well. Yeah, well, it'll probably take... You know, within a week for sure, the video will be up, but possibly sooner. So I just want to thank you once again for everybody watching. Hopefully you found some value out of that. I'm sure you will. Um, so, David, thank you. And uh, if I can ever do anything for you, you know where to find me. Drop me an email, reach out. Uh, be glad to be glad to do what I can for you. As a way to say thank you. For the uh, success story. So appreciate you. Appreciate you.